Welcome to another virtual or at-home edition of the Square and Compass podcast, because obviously we can't be meeting in person. But even if uh, without the current situation, this would probably still be uh, virtual because you are calling in all the way from Alberta. So welcome. Yes, I am. Thank you. You, uh, you're a member of Acacia Lodge, which yes, Acacia uh, Lodge number eleven in Edmonton. And you are the junior warden. That is correct. And uh, tell me about how you first became involved in in masonry. Do you remember? You told me you've been a mason for twenty three years, so. You're almost at your 25 year pin. You just got two years to go. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm looking forward to that 25 year milestone for sure. You know, it was funny. Uh, you, you think back to when I was a kid and my dad, who was actually present uh, tonight during the, the uh, virtual meeting, um, <clears throat> I, I remember him always going to these these meetings and and seeing seeing this apron and and the book that you could never decipher and had all these words missing. You know, it was it was always a fascination to me as a kid. Um, as I got older, uh, things became more and more uh, clear. Uh, I understood a little bit more because we would always attend the church functions that all the Masons would, would march into church. Um, and then uh, I started finding out that there were more and more of my family members, uncles, cousins, both of my grandfathers were a Mason. Um, we, we pretty much had, we could have had our own degree team if we wanted to. <laughs> Um, but you know, I, I've had things passed down where I've actually got my grandfather's master Mason apron and that was presented to me, um, when I became a master Mason, which was actually, um, the first lodge, my mother lodge was in Kirkland Lake, uh, Ontario. That's where I became a master Mason. Um, so yeah, it was presented to me, uh, a lot of fond memories. Um, you know, even, even the Masonic Bible that was presented to me, uh, I've still got it and I carry it with me through on my journey, uh, you know, into different, different areas of the Masonic uh, Brotherhood. It's interesting you mentioned that your father, you grew up in a Masonic family. My father was a Mason as well. So I remember those, you know, Masonic get-togethers as a child and seeing your dad. Um, yeah. I don't know if you, if you have any similar memories, but one thing that sticks out to me when I think about my my father uh, and his Masonic journey is he worked for the railroad. So he was always up about 6 a.m. to go to work. And I'd hear him in the kitchen as he's getting ready for work talking to himself over and over <laughs> again. I remember thinking, my dad must be crazy. I don't know what he's saying, but he's just yeah. mumbling to himself all morning before he goes to work. Of course, years later, I understand. I know I'm the one mumbling to myself, but uh, <laughs> that's always something that stuck with me. Yeah, uh, I, I know when I went up through my three, three degrees, I actually worked in a gold mine up in Kirkland Lake. So I had lots of free time when I was walking down those empty drifts to talk to myself. <laughs> Yeah, if somebody if somebody's talking to themselves on the street, they might be crazy or they might be a mason. Probably both, to be fair. But yeah. <laughs> now you uh, you joined in in Kirkland Lake, so that's your mother lodge. Yeah. But now you are presently yeah. in Acacia Lodge. Uh, yeah. I talked to um, another brother here about this, but how did you find the process of affiliating or or changing lodges? And what advice would you give to a brother who is for work or for family reasons has to move and is looking for a new lodge? You know, I just, I, I stumbled across it really. Like I had moved. So that was sort of the last thing on my mind. You know, I had, 
okay, now I got to move my family here. I, that's, that's like the first thing that I got to, I got to do, but I just happened to be walking downtown Edmonton, um, past their, one of the largest lodges there, um, and oldest. They, uh, and actually Rod Ponick, who was on here and he's past Grand Lodge, uh, member he just happened to be walking down the alley going in the back door and I just stumbled into him and said hey how do I affiliate and there's a number of lodges here and I have no idea how to get into it and I sat down and had coffee with me and he just laid it out you know the demographics of every lodge and you know where I would probably fit in best which just happened to be his lodge. Um, and it was, it was an easy process to actually, uh, once, once I had met somebody and started talking to them, you know, they just walked me right through the process and there was a matin, you know, no time at all. I was, I was starting to attend the meetings. Did you have any nerves about joining a, or affiliating with the new lodge or joining a new lodge? Yeah. Yeah. You know, of course, you're the new guy again. Um, so, of course, all the guys that are there, the, especially the ones, the, the, the long timers that have been in the lodge, you, you could feel them looking at you because you got to earn their trust. Um, you know, you, you already have the trust of, of Masons. Uh, when, you, when you come up through, um, you know, your three degrees, but it's a different kind of trust when you start walking in and it was like, okay, yeah, I'd like to get involved. I'd like to do this, but they don't really know you and they don't really want to release the reins as much as, you know, at first. So I just got in and started helping where I could. And when they asked me, Hey, can you help us out in one of the deacons chairs? Well, I had already gone through the deacon and, I jumped at it. I was like, yeah, why not? Sure. And that just started building my trust up again. I started working my way back up again. And as you're working your way back up through the, through the chairs, um, what type of things did you, uh, did you notice or, or what chairs did you enjoy? What chairs have you enjoyed? Did you, have you enjoyed your time as junior warden, even though right now you don't get to do as much of the, <laughs> the work as you might otherwise but what what did you particularly enjoy about your journey through the chairs um i think i had so far the most fun in the deacon's chair uh because you're you're really involved a lot in the uh in the process when the initiations and you know the second degree and just being involved to to help that person on their journey um that you know it really means a lot just just being their guide uh through that whole process i i had a lot of fun with that i agree i think i think deacon is one of the most under appreciated offices or officers uh in in a lodge for that reason to me a, a deacon is what sets the tone right if you have a deacon who's nervous or uncomfortable or or not sure of their work then that really makes the candidate nervous and you know they're already nervous enough as it is so having that having a deacon is such an important have is such an important you know off office and they are the the guy there your first Masonic contact, really, as a Mason. They're the ones leading you around. So I always think it's kind of an, I don't think we always recognize how important a deacon is for a candidate as that guide and that first point of contact. As you, uh, you know, speaking of, well, we'll go back to that idea of, of uh, a deacon. What advice would you have for uh, a brother who is, um, looking at going into the officer's chairs, particularly going into the deacon's chair, how did you particularly enjoyed it? So what about that? Did you enjoy and what advice would you give to a new deacon or brother going into the deacon position? 
your deacon office? Um, I, I say when you get the opportunity, um, take it. Uh, you know, I, I, when I first started off in Kirkland Lake, I was in the stewards chairs, um, which is a, a great way to start lending a hand around, around the uh, hall uh, before and after meetings. Uh, and that's where you really, you start to get to know all the brethren and because uh, you're like one-on-one -on -one with all of them. Uh, whether it's, you know, serving food or, you know, serving drinks or just helping clean up. Um, but yeah, when you get that opportunity to get into uh, the junior deacons chairs, yeah, jump at it because it's, that's where I find your transformation is going to take it to a next level. Um, yeah. And what advice would you, or in your own story, in your own 23 year, you know, Masonic journey, what, what kind of stands out for you so far in that journey? Certainly it sounds like, you know, your family ties to Masonry would be uh, something that would stand out, but also what are you looking forward to moving forward in your Masonic journey? Oh, I gotcha. To um, which as it yeah, as it, as it stands right now, um, I'll be hitting that 25th year when I uh, reach the master's chair, which is sort of going to be like a double milestone altogether. Yeah, so that that itself is going to be a lot of fun. Um, you know, I had a lull there where I was doing a lot of work, so I couldn't attend Masons. Um, you know, or I would have been probably in the Mason or the master's chair quite a long time ago. But, uh, you know, just to see how close I am now gets me more excited. Any thoughts about yeah. how what you want to do for your, your year as master? <laughs> no, no, I, I'm just trying to get through the junior warden chair right now. It's, you know, I've got a little bit of a break for planning suppers and things right now. Um, but yeah, going through junior warden's chair, it was always, okay, that dinner's done. Now, what am I going to do for the next one? And it was just, your mind is always turning. So I'm just looking forward to getting this one done so I can move on. Yeah. The, yeah. it's a, yeah, I remember that. I remember I've, I've been a junior warden, I think three times. So yeah, once you're done one meeting, you're just thinking about the next one right away. That's right. Yeah, uh, but you did you did mention right you've got a bit of a break right now from suppers as do all the junior wardens. How has the Grand Lodge in Alberta uh, and your lodge in particular dealt with uh, the you know, current circumstances? I'm assuming that in Alberta they have suspended all Masonic activity, and Ontario is suspended in early March. Um, but Grand Lodge itself, like the functions of Grand Lodge are still going on. The office is empty, but they're still picking up mail and answering e electronic correspondence. And like, I'm the uh, secretary of Harmony Lodge, so we're still in contact with the master and the brethren. How has it been in Alberta? How has Alberta been dealing with the current situation? Yeah, it's about the same. Uh, every once in a while, you receive correspondence from Grand Lodge. So yeah, they're still functioning, um, but yeah, everything is suspended. I know it was really hard for the first few weeks. Um, and then, uh, one of the, the members, um, thought it would be kind of nice just to try to get brethren together for some fellowship and, and since we can't have a, a tiled meeting uh, virtually, they thought, well, why can't we do education? And the Grand Lodge backed it. They said, no, there's there's no reason why you can't because what they're going to teach is basically in the history books. Um, so, yeah, they accepted that. And a few lodges around here started it. Um, and then I had heard about uh, a lodge up in Alaska that was a week or two ago that they, they did it. Um, so yeah, we jumped on it. Our first one was tonight. 
Uh, it was a really good night. Had an awesome turnout. And uh, now we're looking forward to uh, on our regular meeting nights at doing more education. So hopefully the next one we'll have twice as many brethren. Absolutely. It was, it really was a terrific, uh, terrific evening. I'm very happy that you sent me the invitation and invited me to, uh, to participate. You know, is, is that the silver lining in all of this? Do you think that now we have the opportunity to, you know, focus on Masonic education, maybe reach out to brethren electronically, um, you know, can make connections you wouldn't normally make? Yeah, um, it uh, it was it was it was tough at the beginning. Yeah, it uh, of all of what's happening in the world right now, um, and I know we were we were all trying to you know send messages through Facebook saying okay you know just reach out make sure you reach out to a brother just anybody just pick up the phone so he knows he's not forgotten um you know and then and then when these zoom calls started up this is just how technology is just added to that where now we can actually bring a lot more people to the table and enjoy those laughs that we were experiencing every two weeks tell me about your masonic temple because one thing about Square and Compass Promotions, which is kind of this, this, this business I started, part of it is about promoting masonry um, in Essex, but also part of it is about promoting our Masonic Temple, because Windsor has an absolutely beautiful Masonic Temple. It's 100 years old as of next year. It's, you know, been visited by prime ministers, and it's been such an integral part of the life of Windsor and Essex and Detroit for for those hundred years, I really wanted to do more to promote just the importance of our temple to the community, to both Masons and non-Masons. And you mentioned, you know, earlier in this interview, you were new to Edmonton and you kind of stumbled upon the Masonic Temple. So tell me about the temple that you uh, that you meet at and kind of memories you have of it. Um, I think every Masonic Temple, you know, has its own history and its own memories there it's a masonic home so tell me about yours yeah well where we meet it's it's actually the acacia hall uh, and it's not in downtown edmonton it's in an area called old strathcona uh, which used to be a very small town i guess you could say on the outskirts of edmonton back in the old days uh, you know we're hundred I believe they're saying we're coming up to 120 year uh, anniversary something like that uh, I could be mistaken um, but yeah the first pre or the first master was actually the premier the first premier of uh, Alberta so it's it's a small uh, lodge it's a uh, quaint you know the it, it just amazes you. you. You walk around the floor and it's got that old creaky floor as you're walking around. And But it's so nostalgic. It's, uh, it's one of those buildings that you never want to see die. You know, you, you just want to do anything possible just to keep this thing moving. Uh, it's just a beautiful little building. Um, the one downtown, that's, that's a large one, um, you know, back in the day when they, they had, there was a large hotel right by the river. And then the second largest building was actually the Masonic Hall in Edmonton. And all these big bands of the era used to play in there. It actually had the biggest dance hall and theater there. So that in itself is big history, which, uh, which I'm not a hundred percent on, but yeah, no, Acacia Hall, number 11 in the old Strathcona. Yeah. No. Know, check it out. It's, it's a very quaint little, uh, hall, but it's, it's, it's fun. 
what uh, what you said about uh, you know, Acacia Hall uh, is exactly the way I feel about the Windsor Masonic Temple. You know, it's such a it's such a hist- piece of history, and when you're in in the building, you do feel that nostalgia. You know, it's a place of of brotherhood and a place of it's it's your family. It's your home away from home. So yeah, yeah I just the Masonic temples are so important and have such a, a nostalgic feeling to them. Any uh, any ghost stories from Acacia Hall? Because I love that type of stuff. Windsor's got a few. Oh, <laughs> I you know honestly I haven't heard any of those stories for Acacia Hall. Uh, the the temple downtown. Yeah, I've heard uh, a few stories about you know some some spirits roaming around the hallways and <laughs> we actually had a uh, one of the the first things i did a couple of years ago well one of the first things i did when i started to really get invested in in the building and promoting it was uh we had some paranormal investigators come through our building we actually interviewed them for this podcast and we've got it officially confirmed that we are haunted so uh <laughs> hopefully maybe acacia or edmonton can do the same thing yeah <laughs> You, uh, you mentioned your, you know, we talked earlier, you're 23 years in, you're going to be 25 years in, and uh, that'll con- coincide with your year as Worshipful Master. Uh, you know, one, I don't know if, if every lodge, I think, has its own traditions, but one tradition I've started for Masons, which I think is something I always talk about with, with guys, when I have a new entered apprentice, or I guess every entered apprentice is new, when I have a initiation, um, when it's finished and when I was worshipful master, I would give the, uh, initiated entered apprentice, uh, a piece of paper and it would say two at the top would say two and it'd have the brother's name. And then at the bottom, it would say from, and it would have the same brother's name, but it would be dated 25 years in the future. And I would ask that entered apprentice to write a letter to himself that would be sealed and kept with the lodge and it would be returned to him in 25 years when he receives his 25 year pin. So I don't know if that's something you guys are interested in doing, but I always thought it was a cool idea. So I always like to, to promote it. That is a neat idea. Yeah. yeah. We've got a few now, the first ones to be opened in uh, 2040. So looking forward to, uh, cause we, I guess wow. he joined, yeah, 2015. So it's, it's uh, over in this way, but it's kept, uh, safe and in a sealed envelope and it will be opened again in uh yeah 2040 because 2015 is when we started it do you have any does acacia lodge have any not that tradition but any traditions that they themselves have in particular or any anything unique to alberta uh you know i've been with the lodge uh, let's see, three or four years. I'm, I'm just starting to see some some of the traditions uh, happen. Uh, I know some of the lodges around here. Uh, they, you know, once they receive the Master Mason, uh, they actually present them with the Masonic Bibles. Um, there is. Uh, also, yeah, when they get to a certain, uh, when they also get up to, I believe it's the Masonic, they, one of our, our brethren actually makes out of wood um, the square and they present it to, to all those members that just were, were brought up to uh, the Master Mason level so they can keep, which I think is a great little uh addition to what they've got that is awesome yeah it's stuff like that i love hearing about how local lodges or different lodges carry on traditions and develop traditions because you know masonry should be there should be uniformity you should be able to be in any lodge and recognize it is a masonic lodge but also you want some unique flavor you want you know unique yeah. It's actually been funny uh, the last couple of years. It's it's almost like they took it upon themselves, whereas uh, one master is stepping down and the new master is coming up, that 
the new IPM will actually get a gavel made for the new incoming master. And it, it sort of goes along with the character of that new master. Uh, one of our past masters, he's a big rugged guy. Well, it literally looked like a Vikings <laughs> but it suited him and that was his gavel and we just thought it was a lot of fun and yeah it just keeps carrying on and yeah throughout his term in the chair yeah he gets his own particular gavel that he can take with him that's awesome what, what do you think your gavel is going to be have they told you what it's going to look I, like i have no idea <laughs> I uh, I know one lodge in Windsor, St. Andrew's Lodge, they presented their uh, their master with a gavel. He was a big, I guess, fan of Marvel. So they his gavel was uh, Thor's hammer. They, uh, nice. So, but he could he could pick it up. He was worthy. None, nobody else could. <laughs> have you, um, have, has your lodge outside of the masonic education that you've been doing and which you invited me me to which was very much appreciated um you know everybody's kind of in limbo right now do you think do you have any idea when lodges in alberta might start meeting again or what what the thoughts are i mean uh, ontario right now is suspended till june 1st but it's probably going to go longer is kind of what the assumption is uh any thoughts in alberta it's it's about the same um, I know they were saying around June as well, uh, for here, but it's, it's interesting with what's happening. It's, it's not like we're going week to week. It's like, we're going hour to hour right now. It's everything changes so fast. Um, I personally believe it's going to be a long drawn out battle, but you know, we, your um i believe it was brother andrew mentioned that yeah. he he thinks once this is all over with mason will come back stronger than ever um i have heard some concerns the other way some brethren are worried uh, that you know masonry is a habit so if you you know miss a few meetings in a row it can be hard to get back into it for some brethren where do you f uh, fit on that do you how do you think this will affect masonry once we're allowed to meet again and able to meet again? I agree with uh, what you said about the habit. Um, however, you know, if you're into masons and you really hold it dear to your heart, um, it's, it's just like going back to see your friends again when school starts. Um, uh, you can't wait for it. Uh, you know, being able to pick up the phone or see him virtually, that's one thing, but to actually get in there and, you know, put your hand on their shoulder and it's, it's a whole new level. So to be able to get back in there, it's going to be, it's going to be a great feeling again. Have you been, uh, using your time to study your cookbooks, figure out any new recipes to, uh, feed the guys? <laughs> I wish I could say so. Um, right now, it was like I had double duty. It was not only am I working from home, but I'm also homeschooling two kids. Oof. So, uh, oh. <laughs> well, I uh, I try when I was worshipful master to uh, to learn how to cook for the guys. I think it was successful, though some brethren may strongly disagree with my cooking skills. So. Uh, you know, I think it all depends who you ask. What do you guys, uh, when do you guys have your, your refreshment? Is it before lodge or after lodge? You know, uh, what, whenever we're having a degree, uh, we'll have it, uh, after, uh, after the lodge meeting. Um, that just gives all the brethren time to welcome, uh, the new initiates or if they've moved up to fellow crafter and master Mason properly um but if it's a regular lodge meeting we found doing it prior to the meeting we're actually getting more brethren out um because if if for regular meetings if we're holding it at the end of the night 
uh, a lot of guys are just saying, hey, I got to get up early for work tomorrow. Sorry, I'm out of here. And you might be only left with the select few that always come. Uh, so yeah, this, this, when we switched it to before the lodge meetings, we've got amazing numbers. So that might be a, something to consider for, for any, you know, brethren watching this. Uh, cause I know that there's always a debate in Windsor and I'm sure everywhere about when to hold your refreshment before or after. Uh, yeah. Any, any favorites for the guys, any favorite meals that you've done or? Do the guys always request something? Uh, no, I haven't got any requests yet. I know the pulled pork's gone over well, the barbecue. Um, it's it's kind of nice because our master actually owns a butcher shop. So uh, some nights we'll actually get some, some sweet brisket uh, coming in or roast beef dinners. Those always go really well. Uh, you get the mashed potatoes and the homemade gravy, and yeah, nice. What um, what type of what type of advice would you have for brethren moving into the warden's position? Because once you know, I said before, and we talked about the importance of the deacon position, but I think a lot of brethren get nervous about uh, possibly being a, a junior warden. Yeah, uh, because that when you're in a junior warden's chair, you're it's kind of a clear direction to the master's chair and the responsibilities start to increase. You should be visiting more as a warden. So what advice would you have for brethren moving to either new to the junior warden's chair or moving to the junior warden's chair? Um, I would say if you're a senior deacon, pay attention. <laughs> <laughs> pay attention to what's going on because um, it's going to come up on you pretty quick it does it goes yeah. it that year goes by so fast yep oh yeah yep and uh you know you talked about uh you're working you have a family you have kids in school uh you know even during this but even before this how did you balance all of those things, because I know a lot of brethren in, in Windsor, just uh, Masons in general, always struggle with trying to balance their Masonic duties with their work life, with their family life, with other extracurricular activities. So how did you, uh, what advice do you have about balancing all of that? Uh, ask your brothers for help. Um, we're all in this together. So don't try to take it all on yourself. That's that's the one thing I learned um, is, is when I became junior warden and the stress uh, was unbelievable. And, you know, after that, we, we talked amongst the other officers, the other brethren, and that's where people just reached out. It was like, Brother Jolliffe, uh, do you need help doing this? Do you need help doing that? Hey, I can pick up the potatoes or I can pick this up or pick up the refreshments for you. And after that was all said and done, it was like, oh, thank you. You know, and that's what it's all about. It's it's the comradeship and, and the partnership is, you know, a unit to, to work with each other. Asking for help is so important. And Masons are not good at that, I think. Masons are good at <laughs> Masons are good at offering help, but they're not always the best at asking for it, myself included, yeah. uh, when you need to ask for help sometimes. And it's such an important thing for Masons to remember, is that. Yeah. And also you can't, you know, you can't always be the one offering help if you're not willing to accept it too, because then nobody wants to offer, you know, nobody wants to accept help, then what's you gotta you got to do both, right? Part of being a brother is accepting help when it's offered or asking for help, which is something I'm not the best at, but I'm learning because there's been plenty of times when I've needed help in my Masonic career or to, you know, to be successful as an officer. Um, so, yeah, that's good advice to go into the junior warden's chair for sure. And I agree completely. Yeah. What, what would you say, where do you see the future of, of masonry 
in both Alberta and just in general, even before this, uh, even before the current, you know, current circumstances, do you have, do you think there's challenges that are coming up that we're gonna have to deal with? Do you think that masonry is in a good position moving forward? Kind of where do you see masonry going? You know, I, it, it's funny when I first got into Lodge, um, there was quite a few of us joining and that was back in 97. Um, but I, I found as I got older, then the newer generation was coming up. It was a different uh, view that they had. Um, you know, we were coming in basically a lot of us on the coattails of say our fathers that were already in. Now the newer generation is coming in. They're asking more and more questions. Uh, they see a lot of things on TV. Um, and, and that's where a lot of these questions come, you know, all these movies that are coming out like national treasure and, and everything like that, you know, it, it raises all these ideas in their head and, and sort of pushes them back a little bit, which, you know, keep, keeps the numbers down a bit. Um, so I think that education at getting out there and in the community and, and being able to meet people and talk to them and, and invite them in, you know, don't be afraid of our lodge room. Uh, you know, we'll invite prospective uh, people to a dinner before a lodge meeting, and then we take them upstairs. Even if their wife is there for a dinner or something, come on up, see what's upstairs. We're not hiding anything. And and just talk about it, get it out there and, and say, you know, this is what this means. This is what this means. It, it clears up a lot and when we started to do that we found that we were getting a lot of younger masons coming into the fact uh, my my cousin who is actually on the meeting tonight he's actually the youngest member in our lodge he's 25 so and he's already helping out in the steward's chair i i joined when i was that age, I, I think I was twenty six actually when I joined, but I remember I was talking to, uh, you know, the the arrogance of youth. I was talking to uh, a brother who was a bit older than me, uh, Paul Rogers, who was the worship. He was the one who raised me when I became master mason. But I uh, was talking to him, and I told him, he said, "How you doing?" I said, "I'm I'm doing all right, but I'm concerned because I'm." going to be 27 and then 30 is just around the corner and I don't want to be 30. And then he told me I could do something to myself, which is not, <laughs> not anatomically possible, but uh, gosh, 25, we have Masons, you know, in our lodge who are 22. One of them is 21, which is just, I see them. It's nuts to me. I'm 36 now, so I'm not that old, but it yeah. feels, feels a long way from 21, 22. Yeah. No. And, and, it's, it's like anything, like any kind of careers um, that were slowly dwindling. I'm a surveyor by trade, and you saw that, that career path just dying. And it was all because of the education, not getting out there and talking to people. Um, yeah. It, uh, that that's what I think, and as as long as we're out there, and that's where you you start to see a lot of Facebook pages for lodges come up, and uh, um, you know when people are asking you, you just say, hey, here's the link to our website. Go on in and read about the history about Acacia Lodge Number Eleven, and and you know find out some information, and then after that we can sit down and have a coffee. Absolutely. Yeah. You mentioned, uh, it's interesting, you talked about Masonic movies, masonry in media. One podcast I did, which will be coming out soon, is with uh, Worship Brother Igor Strukin, 
we actually reviewed Masonry in Pop Culture. The first movie I picked, because I love it, is uh, uh, From Hell starring Johnny Depp. Even though Masons are not necessarily the good guys in that movie. But Igor was like, you're yeah. going to get us in trouble with Grand Lodge picking this movie. But do you uh, do you prefer, or what type of, when Masonry is portrayed in movies... Do you prefer the ones where the Masons are the good guys? I always like the ones where the bad guys. I think it makes it where the you know it's cool to be the villains, even though it's completely uh, you know it's pretty far fetched. Some of them. I always think it's kind of fun when we're at the head of conspiracies. Who doesn't love a good conspiracy? But do you do you worry that that can sometimes? Oh, yeah. Do you think that that can sometimes harm the reputation of Masonry, or do you think people just take it in good fun? You know it's. It's funny. I remember when National Treasure movie first came out and I went to the movie theater and when the lights came up, you looked around and you see a groups of men sitting around and then you start seeing the rings on their fingers and guys are like looking at each other thinking, really? Could this be possible? <laughs> so it's, you know, things like that, you know, aren't too bad. Um, when you start getting into other other types of movies where it's showing them as the bad guy, um, oh. then then it 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 could potentially push people further away if they're thinking about it. Uh, so many of the younger generation, like they just take a lot of those movies and documentaries and things for to heart but some of these documentaries that's all that is is that person's view so absolutely yeah yeah you got to take it with a grain of salt really you go in there and it, it's fun you sit there and you watch it like you know movies with uh tom hanks you know angels and demons and things like that it's it's like <laughs> okay, that's kind of interesting. <laughs> have you found any good movies during uh, all of our self-imposed quarantines? Have you? Well, I guess you've been pretty busy though, right? Working from home and homeschooling. Yeah. You might not have the time to uh, peruse Netflix <laughs> as some other people have found themselves doing. Oh, when we sit down to actually watch a movie, it's it's like half an hour in, all of a sudden you start nodding off. <laughs> um, yeah, no, it uh, not any Masonic movies. Just in um, general, any? Yeah, the series that we, my wife and I, really got into. It's called Money Heist. Okay. It's uh, it's in Spanish, but uh, it it's got the English subtitles, and it's funny. It's in its third season, um. But just to watch the documentary afterwards on how it was only in Spain for the first season, it dropped off the charts. And then after the Netflix got a hold of it and opened it up to the world, it just became a phenomenon. Yeah, so it, it's really cool to actually see the history on how these these actors that you'd never heard about all of a sudden just became superstars nice well speaking of um you know one one thing i should talk about from the ontario perspective uh the time that we're recording this is uh something it's the time when we have to start looking at doing what's called our cornerstone submissions i'm wondering if alberta has anything similar cornerstone is a project by our grand lodge where they've set out certain standards um, and lodges, if they meet a set number of those standards in a two year period, they get a cornerstone designation, which is like, a, you know, meritorious service award or person of the year, that type of thing. And they get to call themselves a cornerstone lodge um, for meeting those standards. So a lot of lodges right now are in the process of gathering their minutes from the last two years and all of their, their documentation to prove to Grand Lodge that they've, uh, you know, achieved those standards, such as having sufficient number of degrees, having sufficient number of education, having sufficient mentorship program. I'm wondering if Alberta has anything similar, if the Grand Lodge of Alberta has implemented any programs like that. 
Uh, at this point, I wouldn't be able to answer that. I'm not a hundred percent sure on that that topic. Yeah. Cool. Well, I'm just in the midst of organizing it all. So if uh, I've been thinking a lot about it, it's a good it's a good thing to consider, even at the lodge level, to start like a uh, to bring it to Grand Lodge. Uh, yeah. Oh yeah. It, sure. I know a lot of lodges have. It really forces you to pay attention to what you're doing and where you can improve um, in order to meet those standards. Do you have a uh, active mentorship program in Acacia Lodge or in Alberta? Or is it, it, does it come through like, is there a committee or is it just past masters will mentor the new entered apprentices? Uh, yeah, no, I, I even, I haven't seen a mentorship uh, program um, as of yet. What about just yeah. informally, though? I'm, I'm assuming guys will call up their, you know, masters or the maybe the brethren who bring them in, sponsor them to help them with their degree work and getting ready. Oh yeah, yeah. No, we, uh, yeah, we do do that. Um, yeah, if we're doing our degree work. Uh, we'll have a lot of the older brethren will come in and yeah, they'll sit right there. They'll help you. Uh, you know, usually they're the first ones that will jump up to, to correct you and get you back on track. Yeah. <laughs> I'm guessing uh, based on the, the sounds I'm hearing that uh, either you're very hungry or you've got a, uh, you've got a dog with you. I got a dog with me. What's your uh, <laughs> What's your dog's name? Pardon me. What's your dog's name? Uh, Ozzy. Ozzy, nice. What type of dog? Sounds like a big uh, one. He's uh, part shepherd. So pretty big, probably. Yeah. 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 yeah let's let the people, the one hundred and sixty nine subscribers. Ah, cute dog. <laughs> has he uh, has he been to Acacia Lodge at all yet? Is he has he made it to the lodge? <laughs> no, he hasn't been there. I uh, well, he is a he, so I uh, I've never seen a, a dog in lodge myself. Though I have heard stories. Actually, no, that's not true. I think I did, but gosh, where was it? I visited a lodge where there was at least a like a place for a dog to sleep like a dog bed in the lodge room and I guess sometimes uh the worship master would bring his dog to lodge and he'd sleep there or something like that so you know there's, oh, really? there's precedent somewhere for it I'm sure <laughs> I don't know how he'd repeat his obligation but I'm sure Ozzy would find a way yeah <laughs> so what would you say um you know as we're as we're going through this um like you said, we don't know when lodges will be meeting again. Um, everything's in a state of flux. So to the, you know, the Brethren of Acacia Lodge as one of the wardens, but also just in general, what what would you say to everybody as we kind of wait for this all to, to go through? Stay in touch with each other. Um, I think that's the biggest thing for us to get, get through this. Um, you know whether they show it or not i think there's a lot of a lot of the brethren out that can't get out of their houses at all um so it impacts you mentally as well as physically um so yeah just just the fact to reach out uh to say hi you know that you know we're thinking about you um just you know, if you do need something, we'll try to figure out a way to get it to you. Uh, just helping one another so that we can get through this together. Perfect. That, and I think that's a great place to uh, to leave it. One thing yeah. I, I love about Freemasonry is the chance to meet new brethren. And it's been a real pleasure getting to, to meet you uh, all the way over in Alberta and getting a chance to take part in the Masonic oh. education. Um, and yeah, by all means, tell tell your your brethren in lodge about you know Square Encompass promotions. We have podcasts featuring you know interviews with masons or people who have some connection to the Masonic Temple, um, and also just little pieces of history about our building and about masonry in Windsor Essex. Uh, 
but also it's a real pleasure to get to talk to somebody from out of province, from all the way in Alberta, to hear your perspective on everything and uh, learn a little bit about your lodge. So thank you so much. Thank you very much. And uh, yeah, as I mentioned to you earlier, um, yeah, our lodge is looking to have more of these educational nights and I think it'd be it'd be a great uh, treat to have more brethren from my home province of Ontario uh, attend. You know, let's just it's it's literally you could look at it that uh, one lodge visiting another lodge. Uh, you know, and that's the visitation is is really important. Um, and it, I uh, I am sending out the we are still sending out summonses. I'm not sure if they're doing it in Alberta. We we still send out a summons. We don't yeah. obviously we have suspended lodge meetings, but it's a chance to remind brethren of you know numbers to call if they need assistance with benevolence or have any questions. Uh, and I'm going to make sure when I send it out to include uh to include information about Acacia Lodge and perhaps your email. So if brethren are interested in signing up for some education, they can get in touch with you directly. And yeah, you bet. It's uh, it's been a pleasure, brother. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, and have a great evening. You as well. And.